And you can take your Bibles and you can go to Exodus chapter 12, second book in the Bible, Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. That's where we're going to start today as we begin a series that I hope will change the way you view the Bible and will seriously grow your faith. You know, God is not a God of accident. You know that, right? That means He is purposeful in all He does. God is not haphazard. While we may live in a world that seems like it's just full of haphazard, accidental things, all this stuff going on, say, how could God be in that and how could God be in this and all that, that's all, all the haphazardness of this world is a result of fallen humanity, a world that is in sin. We create that. God does not create that, all right? The Bible is a systematic revelation of God, of His character, His purposes, and ultimately His salvation. Themes are just kind of woven through the Scriptures, sometimes very obvious, sometimes a little more hidden, and we have to dig for them. For instance, when we look at the Old Testament, we see a law given with a purpose. But for most Christians... Uh, we see a race of people called the Hebrews to whom that law was given and we barely scratch the surface in understanding of God's work through them. We barely study it at all. We talk about Jesus all the time and we, we talk about maybe the Ten Commandments and we talk about sin in some churches at least. <laughs> Praise God here. But, but we rarely really examine how God revealed Himself through His chosen people. I mean, really dig into that. This series should hopefully whet our appetites to, to want to study more about the Hebrew people, more about the law, the precepts God handed down to them through Moses as we look at the significance of the feasts. For the next seven Sundays, because there's seven feasts, we're going to study... The, the significance of those feasts commanded by the Lord for the Hebrew people. We're going to study them chronologically, starting with Passover today. I told somebody I was doing this series, they said, why didn't you do that back at Easter? I said, well, because God didn't lay it on my heart at Easter. Sorry. But, uh, but we're going to hit at some of the harvest ones right at Thanksgiving, which is our harvest celebration time. We're going to study them chronologically, starting with the Passover and ending with the Feast of Tabernacles in December, right leading into Christmas. And believe it or not, I'll be able to tie the two together. Leviticus 23, you might want to write this down. Leviticus 23, we're not going to go there this week, but we will at some times, gives an overview of the feasts. I encourage you to go read that chapter maybe today or this week if you want to really be more prepared for the rest of the series. Overall, the feasts are separated into two groups. There's the spring feasts and the fall feasts, none in the summer, none in the winter, okay? There are four spring feasts and three fall feasts. All of them are related to the redemptive work of the Messiah, starting with Christ's Passover sacrifice on the cross in the spring. The spring feasts were all fulfilled in Jesus during His first coming. So when Jesus came, took on human form, became God incarnate, the first four feasts were all fulfilled through His work done at His first coming. One of them after his ascension, we'll see that. But essentially all of them, those four have been completed, fulfilled by Christ. The other three, the fall feasts, have yet to be fulfilled. When do you think they'll be fulfilled? At his second coming, when he returns, when our redemption draweth nigh. Now, you may think this is, might sound like it's going to be dry. It might be you know, boring. You know, so I'm going to snooze it through this one. You know. Maybe you think it's going to be hard to understand. Well, let me ask you, when, when have I ever preached to where it's been hard to understand? Never. That's right. I, 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 pride's not a good thing, but the one thing I do pride myself on is trying to make sure that everybody in the room gets what I'm saying. Okay? So... No, I'm not going to make this hard to understand. In fact, I'm, I'm probably not going to get as detailed as some of you in this room could get. You, some of you probably have knowledge that goes beyond what I'm going to share. I'm going to try to get more into it. Here's how it's going to flow every time. I'm getting more into what it meant to the Hebrews and why God instituted it. What it means to the church through Jesus Christ who fulfilled it or is appointed to fulfill it. And that's going to be the flow of every single one of these messages. All right? 
But I can assure you that once I start connecting the dots on some things, you're going to look at these feasts and you're going to look at Jesus and you're going to sit up and take notice in a way that you never had before. This series is not going to feed your emotions. I'm not going to be up here telling a bunch of jokes. I may tell some illustrations and you might get a little chuckle at them here and there. This morning I don't have any. This is more of a teaching series and I, I will grant you that. This is more to feed your spiritual intellect and to grow you as a Christian while also every single one of these sermons has an evangelistic element to it before I'm finished. So you'll hear how to accept Christ as well and the need to accept Christ. I hope you're going to find it fascinating as we walk through this. Uh, You're going to get to see the feasts of the Hebrew people through the life of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, all of that in one series in, in just about every sermon. So let's start at the beginning. Someone someone once said it's a very good place to start. So let's start there, okay? That beginning is Passover. Passover is observed to this day in the spring of the year on the 14th day of the Hebrew month, Nisan, which corresponds to our March or April. Understand, whenever I give you dates throughout this series, I'm just kind of giving you a, a, a guide there just so you can kind of get a feel for when they were celebrating it in relation to their planting and their harvest cycles. But the Hebrew people had a lunar calendar. They did not have a solar calendar like we do. And so they had 354 days per year and had to make some serious adjustments every so often All right, because they went by the lunar cycle. So when I say it was March slash April, that's why, because it doesn't quite line up with our months. Passover was one day every year. It was not a week. The events leading up to Passover that we see, especially in the Passion Week of Christ, they might call it Passover week, but Passover was one day. It was the Friday of that week. But the preparations leading up to it were part of it in a way. Passover began in Egypt. It did not begin in Israel. It was when the Hebrews had been in captivity, for, been in Egypt for 430 years, enslaved for much of that time. And they were crying out for deliverance. And God sent them Moses. And God used Moses to petition Pharaoh to let the people go. And he sent plagues to warn Pharaoh. Remember, there were plagues of frogs. There were locusts. There were hail. There was all these plagues. And over and over again, God showed his power and said, Let my people go. And Pharaoh kept refusing. Hold on to that thought. It's very important. Finally, God determined to send one last plague that would leave the whole nation in mourning. He would turn the death angel loose to go through the land and kill the eldest child in each home. Now, let me just stop there. Connecting to what Pharaoh did, and I'll connect it a little bit further. This is where some people, when you're trying to share Christ with them, will go, how could you believe in a God that kills people? I'll answer that here in just a minute. But that's where they would ask that question. In order to protect the Hebrew people from his wrath, God instituted the first Passover. In Exodus 12, we see God's instruction for the Passover. So let's, let's read that. And, and for the sake of time, I'm just going to kind of read it one verse at a time and, and share as I go along, starting with verse 1 of Exodus 12. Now the Lord God said to Moses and Aaron, in the land of Egypt, before they had been delivered, verse 2, this month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now this word lamb could also be kid, which means it could be a sheep or a goat. Verse 4, Now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from, here it is, the goats. So, interestingly enough, this, this lamb or this kid is supposed to not be more than a year old, right? A year old. Uh, signifying its, its innocence, that it is, it's likely not wandered from the fold. All we like sheep have gone astray, Isaiah tells us. But this little itty-bitty lamb has stayed close to mama for quite a while. Hasn't wandered away from mama. If wander, mama doesn't wander, the baby's not wandering. This little lamb can't wander but so far anyway without the shepherd catching up with it. 
This little lamb is growing up hearing that shepherd's voice and doesn't want to get too far away from that shepherd because it feels vulnerable. So it is an innocent lamb in the fact that it has not likely strayed. Hold on to that thought. I'm going to say that a lot this morning. Hold on to that thought, okay? The lamb was supposed to be one per household, meaning it was to be their personal lamb, signifying a personal connection to God in this situation. Yet, if someone else didn't have a lamb, you could share a lamb with that family, and that signifies a communal connection to God and to one another as the people of God. This lamb was to be unblemished, meaning it was spotless. It was to be, be male, which means it was a what, church? Daughter or son? Son. Hold on to that one. <laughs> Verse 6. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. So it was to be set apart on the 10th and kept until the time of slaughter. They were all to kill their lamb at the same time, late in the day before sundown was complete. Verse 7. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. Had to be applied. The blood had to be applied. They shall eat the flesh that same night roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Now, we're told... Uh, elsewhere in the scriptures, and it, it comes up here in just a moment as well. The unleavened bread was to give them a sense of urgency. They, they did not have the time to add leaven to it to make it rise. Leaven is yeast. So they ate a flat bread, basically. All right? Didn't have time. The bitter herbs was meant to point them back to their slavery in Egypt. So they had to keep in mind, they had to hurry. The bread helped them know to hurry, and the herbs made sure they didn't forget where they came from from where God had brought them. Thus, when the Jews observed Passover today, they continued to tell the story and commemorate the event and remember the deliverance and where they had been. Verse 9, Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted the fire, both its head and its legs, along with its entrails. In other words, it's to be completely cooked. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left of it until morning you shall burn with fire. In other words, it has to be put away before the next day, has to be gone, out of sight. Now you shall eat it in this manner, verse 11, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. Can you hear that hurry? Be totally prepared when I'm done, when you're done with this, to leave whenever I tell you to. It is the Lord's Passover. Now, that's easy to look over right there, but I, I almost did. And then I saw it, and I was like, oh, I've I got to talk about that for just a minute. This has got to be a side note right here. It's the Lord's Passover. It was not their Passover. It was God's Passover. And I, I, just as a side note, let me tell you something, and, 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 and you're going to go freaking out when I first say this, all right? We should never see worship as man's way of honoring God. Let me say that again. We should never see worship as man's way of honoring God. It's God's way to be honored through man. It is not about our favorite music. It is not about our favorite formats for worship service. It's about thus saith the Lord. God determines how worship is acceptable. And you know what it is? It has nothing to do with what we do externally. It doesn't matter a bit whether you raise your hands or not. Raising your hands doesn't mean you're worshiping. You could be doing that and be so lost it doesn't matter. The Bible tells us He doesn't require our sacrifices. What does He want? A broken and contrite heart. The one who worships comes humbly before the Lord with a broken and contrite heart, saying, God, I'm not even worthy to be here, and leaves praising God for the opportunity to have worshipped Him. We're not doing God a favor. God has done us the favor. Amen? And so worship is to be totally God-led, totally God-directed. And when we take it over, we make it something way too often, way too far from what He really desires. 
It's God's way to be honored through man. That was a side note. Verse 12. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord, the one who would mercifully pass over but also execute judgments. And here's where I bring it all together. Here's where I answer the people that say, I can't believe it, a God that killed people. God didn't kill anybody. He didn't kill anybody. Over and over and over again, through six plagues, Pharaoh had every opportunity to obey God. God never killed anybody or did anything up to that point. He destroyed their their fields and their crops through locusts and hail. and He did all kinds of things to hurt them financially and other things to say, I'm here. He did things that only God could do. And it wasn't until the seventh plague he said, well, if you're not going to believe that, here's what I'm going to do. Pharaoh, it's your choice. Are you going to save your people or are you going to kill them? And Pharaoh chose to let his people die, which is what sin does. When we choose sin over Jesus Christ, we're choosing death. I've said it many times, God doesn't send anybody to hell. hell. We send ourselves there. He has provided the way of escape, as we're going to see this morning. He's merciful. He's gracious. He's good. How could a good God let these people die? (sighs) Because they refused Him. And the wages of sin is death. Man started dying the moment man chose to disobey God. We brought it on ourselves. But he provides a way. Verse 13. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. A sign that turned away the wrath of God so they would not die. For the Hebrews, this was their delivery from slavery. And God creates the annual observance of Passover as a remembrance for what he did as well as a tool that pointed them to the Messiah to come. So let's walk through these elements of the first Passover. Let's see how they're tied to Jesus, who we know, we believe, is that Messiah. First we noted that the lamb was a young kid, that was not, and that was not about the age, but about innocence. The lamb was to be perfect and unblemished. It was to be male, which made the lamb a son. Jesus met all of those criteria. This pointed to Jesus. In Matthew 1.21... The angel told Joseph, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. But he wasn't just a son. He was the Son of God. I mean, I could go to all kinds of places in the Gospels and make that point. The disciples declare it several times, but I want to go to Matthew 27. Flip to that. You won't have to come back to Exodus. This series is going to be full of page turns, going from Old Testament all the way to New Testament. Matthew 27, 50 through 54. I want to go to the cross on that Passover day and a person who had never met Jesus until that day, a person who had not walked with him, had likely not heard him teach, maybe had heard about him, maybe he'd heard some things, but something happens in this man's life, in this man's heart in this moment. Matthew 27, 50 through 54. Jesus is on the cross as the Passover lamb for us, and he is dying and he is shedding his blood. And we're told, starting in verse 50, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. That's where the other gospels say that he said, it is finished, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Okay, I'll I'll read it, okay. (laughs) Was torn in two from top to bottom. That had never happened before. The earth shook and the rocks were split. I'm going to tell you something. I preached a lot of funerals. I've never had that happen. I've never had the earth shake and rocks start splitting as I preached a funeral. Never. All right? Verse 52, The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. If you're into zombies, well, there you go. 
And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. I have preached many gravesides, and I have never had that happen. Praise God. I'm not sure what I would do in the middle of a cemetery if everybody started coming up out of the graves. I'd probably say, where's the rapture? Come take me now. Verse 54, now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, because they'd never seen this happen either. They had been, they'd crucified a bunch of people. They'd never seen this happen. Became very frightened and said, Truly this was the Son of God. When Jesus, our Passover lamb, died, this Roman soldier identified himself as the Son of God. Amazing that a pagan could see what the Jewish, the learned Jewish leaders could not. We know from Scripture that Jesus was the perfect, unblemished, sinless sacrifice required. He specifically refused to sin when tempted in the wilderness. He refused to forsake his mission when tempted in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying, not my will, but yours be done, which is what we have to do to be saved, by the way. No longer my will with my life, but yours be done with my life. I believe in Jesus. But over in Hebrews 4, 14 through 15, you don't have to turn there right now. It's going to be on the screen. We see these words. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. He was the sinless Son of God, who was also innocent. Now you say, wait a minute, you just said he was sinless. Is it sinless and innocent the same thing? Well, yeah, no. Sinlessness renders us innocent. But during his trial, innocence was the verdict given by Pontius Pilate. He was legally declared innocent by the one before he, who he stood before that had authority over whether he lived or died. In John 18, 38, he said, I find no guilt in him. A legal declaration. He's sitting there, he washes his hands of all of it, but he said, you can do what you want with him, but I find no guilt in him. There's nothing wrong with this man. He was innocent. So Jesus met the criteria for a Passover lamb, for the lamb itself, an innocent, spotless son for a sacrifice. Now remember, the Passover lamb was to be set apart for the purpose of atonement. Remember I talked about that 10 days beforehand. They would set it apart, right? And then they would use their personal lamb so that the wrath of God would pass over the Hebrew houses. Likewise, Jesus was set apart by God the Father for the purpose of atonement for our sin. Sent by the Father out of love for the world to do what only He could do, shed His perfect, innocent blood to bring forgiveness to guilty sinners like you and I. Jesus said in John 12, 27, Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. In other words, for this purpose I'm here. This is what I was set apart for. This is why I became God in the flesh to be the sacrificial lamb, the the once and for all atonement that could deliver people eternally from their sin. Then turn over to 1 Peter 1. That's getting toward the back. 1 Peter 1, 17 through 21. If you find Hebrews, just keep going through James and you'll get there. 1 Peter 1, starting with verse 17. Jesus, the Passover lamb set apart to deliver from the wrath of God to come. And Peter talks about this. Peter knew it. Peter was there. Even though he was denying Jesus, he was there and he saw it all. He heard all the teachings. And when the Holy Spirit fell upon him, it all came into focus for him. He says in verse 17 of 1 Peter chapter 1, If you address his father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conducting yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, because what he's saying is the things of this world are futile, going after the things of the world are futile. Uh, Futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. It's passed along. It's something we believe in, pass along. But with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. 
For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. You know what that means? He was set apart for the foundation of the world for this purpose. But has appeared in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead. He didn't stay dead after he died on the cross. He rose and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are not in the things of this world but are in God. The whole purpose of Jesus set apart until the appointed time so that he would bring us to a point where our hope is in God rather than the things we can achieve in this world because you can't take it with you when you die. It all goes away. It all gets left behind. Yeah, we pass it along. That's all we can do. But we don't take it with us. And we all have to appear before the Lord. And when did did we say the lamb was to be slaughtered? Late in the day, right? Let's make that connection now. They would start out slitting the throat of the lamb and draining out the blood. It was a fairly quick death. Jesus, however, started bleeding before he ever reached the cross. But late in the day, Jesus surrendered his life for me and you, having shed his saving blood. It was so late in the day, they barely had enough time to get him in the tomb before the beginning of Sabbath at sundown, which means he died very late in the day like the Passover lamb was supposed to do. At the time he was dying, the Hebrew people were slaughtering their lambs. You see what I'm saying? Not realizing that the last lamb that ever had to be slaughtered was hanging on that cross. Think back to Exodus in verse 10, we looked at that, where God instructed them then not to leave any of the sacrifice around for the next morning. It was to be gone. What do you think that means? Jesus was taken down from the cross, and he was laid in a tomb out of sight, gone, not to be seen again until the third day. Well, let's add a little bit more to it. Like the lamb belonged to the family in each house, Jesus came to be our personal Savior. It's His desire that everyone in our households come to know Him, that our faith be generational. doesn't always work out that way. I get it. But the goal in our household should be that our entire household be saved. Right? We, our families are our greatest evangelical field, our mission field. And our greatest way of doing evangelism. I mean, I've tried to make sure that my children know Christ and know how to share Christ because someday I'm not going to be here. And they replace me. Whether they're a pastor or not, they replace me in being Christ to the people around them and sharing His love with them. But they also had to share a lamb sometimes because some people didn't have one. And that built community, we said, of the people who had the Passover lamb in common. You see, he's my Savior, but he's also the Savior of others. And by his Spirit, we are the church, the community of the redeemed, and we share in the one Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. We share it. And the more I share my Passover lamb with others, the larger the kingdom of God becomes. See, that's what Chip was talking about all week. He never said Passover lamb. He talked about Jesus. But we're called to share our Passover lamb. Like the Hebrews had to share it with those who did not have one. We are to share Jesus with those who do not have him. The same way. But it's not enough to know he is the Passover lamb. Like the blood had to be applied to the door so that the Hebrews could survive the night. So the death angel would turn away God's wrath and turn away and not pour out God's wrath on their household. We have to have the blood of Jesus applied to our hearts, to our lives. We're deserving of wrath. And the only way we can be forgiven it, the death and death can be averted is, is for us to have the blood applied to our lives. One last turn for you. Hebrews chapter 9. It's just two books back. Hebrews chapter 9, 20, uh, verses 16 through 28. Hebrews 9, 16 through 28. I'm trying not to get too deep on you, but I want you to see the biblical evidence of what I'm saying.
verse 16 of Hebrews 9. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never enforced while the one who made it lives. Now, a covenant is simply an agreement. It was an agreement between God and man. If you will obey me, if you will walk in my ways, I will bless you. If you don't, I will curse you, and that's your fault, not mine. <laughs> All right? That's basically what that covenant means. Verse 18, Therefore, even the first covenant was, inaugurated without, was, was not inaugurated without blood, for when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. And so what we see happening here is this is a covenant with Moses through the law when he gave the law and, and, and said, you know, if you obey this law, you'll be my people. I'll be your God. I will bless you. Verse 20, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. Those words should sound familiar. It's what we're going to talk about here in a few moments when we partake of the Lord's Supper, only it's the different covenant. Jesus borrows the words that were shared with Moses by God the Father. In the same way, verse 21, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. If the blood's not applied, death is eternal. If the blood is applied, life is made eternal by the eternal blood of Christ. Let me keep reading these verses. Verse 23. Therefore it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. The Bible tells us he's, he's there to make intercession for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy priest place year by year with blood that is not his own. We'll get to that on the Day of Atonement feast, but that's what they did once a year, offering a sacrifice for one year of forgiveness. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, all of us will. And after this comes judgment, we all face it. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin. We, we will be judged, but without reference to sin. That's dealt with. Jesus bore that away for those who eagerly await him. That's why Paul could declare in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord because Jesus paid it all. He was the lamb separated out, crucified, his blood shed that the rest of us as his sheep could be saved. Ephesians 1.7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. On screen, Leviticus 17.11 says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. That's how we live, right? You drain our blood out of us, we're dead, right? And I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls so they would drain the blood of a lamb for atonement. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. In other words, a life to save a life. That was the Passover lamb. That was Jesus. His life to save your life. The only way to have eternal life is by the shed blood of the eternal Son of God, Jesus Christ. Those lambs slaughtered by the Hebrew priests all those years offered life for a little while. But because those lambs were under the curse of sin, like all of creation, more had to die to keep atoning for sin. Their sacrifice didn't last. But Jesus was the eternal God incarnate, sinless, innocent, he had eternal blood flowing through his veins. And one drop of that blood applied to the door of your heart means eternal death will never touch you. You might die physically, but you will go to be in the presence of the Lord for all of eternity. All because of one drop of his precious blood. But like with the Hebrews. You know what I sometimes wonder? Let's put it this way. If any Hebrews died that night, for lack of unbelief, for lack of belief. 
If any Hebrews failed to put the blood on the doorpost, they, their firstborn died too. Because the death angel doesn't pass over anyone unless the blood has been applied. It doesn't matter if you're better than somebody else. It doesn't matter if you're wealthier than somebody else. It doesn't matter if you're healthier than somebody else. It doesn't matter if you're smarter than somebody else. It doesn't matter anything that you are. It's about what you've done with Jesus. Will you be passed over? So I ask you, when was your personal Passover? When the blood was applied to your sinful heart so that you could be forgiven. When did you walk out of slavery to sin and into the arms of Jesus the Savior? When did you do that? When, did you, when do you know that you did that? And this answers your question for the child earlier. You've got to be old enough to even know what sin is. And to know that you are a sinner. I'm not asking you when you joined the church or got baptized. I'm asking you when was your personal Passover, a moment in time where you accepted the blood of Jesus and said, thank you, Jesus, I know now that you're going to pass over my sin and I'm going to live forever in your presence. I might still sin, but it's covered. That's what atonement means. It means covering. It's been covered. If you haven't had a personal Passover, isn't it about time you did? The Hebrew people had to be ready to make haste so they could leave the bitterness behind and walk into a new life guided by God. A life full of the miraculous works of God and ultimately leading to the promised land. I want to tell you, Jesus is coming back. And it's getting closer and closer. He's coming to lead his children to the heavenly promised land, but only those covered by the blood will go. So I encourage you, if you're not sure about that, make haste because tomorrow it could be too late. Well, hey there. Didn't mean to startle you, but this is Pastor Chris, and I just finished this message on the Passover, but we, in person in church service we took the Lord's Supper, so we had to stop the recording. But I shared some things further about Passover during the Lord's Supper that I want to share with you now because it was very important, and I didn't want you to miss out on it because you were not there. Uh, When we went to pass the bread, we talked about how matzah was what was used for Passover by the Jews, and uh, it had to be unleavened, as we had already talked about in the message, because leavening it took time, and they had to be in a hurry. And we talked about how leaven symbolizes impurity, which is something we'll talk about in next week's feast, and thus the unleavened bread symbolizes purity. Well, Jesus was the pure sinless sacrifice for our sin, right? The Lamb of God who fulfilled every aspect of the Passover. We've been talking about that. He was not only the Lamb of God, he was the pure unleavened bread, which is what Jesus referred to when he said, this is my body broken for you. He was like, I am the unleavened bread that you're tearing right now. And I'm the pure one, the pure sacrifice. But there's another thing that's very, very important to know about the Passover and how the Hebrews observed it And that there was three pieces of matzah. There was the upper matzah, the middle matzah, and the lower matzah. And before eating any of the matzah, which was kind of like a real flat bread, cracker almost, they would take the middle matzah and break it. They would wrap half of it, and then someone would hide it in the house for the children to look for later. The hidden portion was called the afikamen. And then they would eat the rest of the middle portion. Now, the afikamen represented the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. How do I know that? Well, because remember there was three matzahs, the upper, the middle, the lower. That represents the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The middle one being Jesus who was broken for our sin. Then his body was hidden away in the tomb and then found later uh, when he was arisen. So, and then the other half of it was eaten, just as Jesus instructed his disciples to do in the upper room. And as he had instructed them already, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no part of me. Not literally eating his body and drinking his blood, but symbolically. Uh, we have to take Jesus in. He's our purest form of sustenance for our life. Even food is nothing in comparison to our need for Jesus. And then we took the juice as part of the Lord's Supper. 
And there were four cups used in the Passover, but we didn't get into all four of them, just the third one, which is called the cup of redemption. That's the one Jesus raised and said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Thus, he instituted a new covenant by his blood. Remember, we look back and in Hebrews and we saw how Moses had been told by God, this is the covenant of blood for the sacrifice that would seal the first covenant of the law. Well, Jesus comes back and seals the new covenant in his blood. He is the blood shed to seal that covenant. His eternal blood allows sins to be forgiven once and for all. So once you accept Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, and apply his blood to your heart, you are forever saved by his covenant promise. So we took the Lord's Supper and we talked about those things in addition. And then we close with just a word of prayer. Let me do that with you right now, okay? Father, we thank you for what the Lord's Supper means to us, that it symbolizes um, our relationship with you by your blood that you've purchased for us. Thank you that you have secured a place in your kingdom for all eternity for those that believe in you. We pray for those who do not, that God, they would hear this message or that we would share with them uh, the love of Christ and the story of Christ and our story of what Jesus has done for us so that they too can have the blood applied to their lives and be forever saved. Lord, just guide us and direct us now through the rest of this week. We just give you praise and honor and glory for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me this week. Join me for the midweek this week as we look at the Psalms.